Paradise Killer. Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, last dweller of a dying world. And as we sit here, observing the final sunrise, in this blasted heath of an existence, uh, I thought it'd be nice to do a final little bonus episode at the end of my Let's Play of Paradise Killer. So this is episode bonus of said Let's Play. I've been pretty down on this game throughout my extensive, uh, pretty much almost 100%ing it Let's Play. Uh, and so I thought it would be nice to take a little bonus episode to walk around and talk about some of the, you know, just the little things. Just a, a handful of uh, ephemeral nothings that did please me. Some of, the, some of the items that I found while exploring the world, some of the locations. In a moment I'll dip into the menu system and take a look at some stuff. But um, before then I want to mention that because of the way the game is structured, with a save after the grand finale, I get to explore the, the ruined husk, this kind of delicious looking colour grading of the of the end of the world, but I don't get to explore the, the sun-drenched lovely location that it was previously. Due to unfortunate circumstances, I lost my save set immediately before the grand finale, the trial, which means that I uh, am frustrated by my busted controller. Oh well, I guess I'll just have to put up with that and so will you. Anyway, I had meant to keep a save from right before the trial, but unfortunately, uh, it was lost. Which means that in order to look at the items I've gathered, I have to be here on the apocalypse, end of the world, after the end of the game save file. There's no new game plus that lets me go back to the world as it was with all of my previously gathered items. So, in order to show you some locations that I think are especially nice, and the uh, locational design of this game really is its high point, I'll be jumping into a fresh save file in a little while. But before we do that, I'm just going to squat here in the uh, residential housing district and look at this kind of... You know. Like, if a, if a soft drink can had a label with this colour palette on it, I would probably buy it and drink it. It might be a little bit too sweet, but you know, you've got to put up with these things in life. Well, after trying three different Xbox controllers and my flatmate's Nintendo Switch gamepad attachment, uh, I have suddenly realised that the only reason I was using a controller with this game in the first place was because I had a busted wrist when I started playing it uh, a year ago. I could have been using mouse and keyboard this whole time. Who knew? Anyway, what the hell was I saying? I've already forgotten. So. I'm going to take a quick look in my laptop and have a, a little examination about the the cool items that I found that I liked and some of the other stuff in there. Then I'm going to dip to a new save file and go take a look at a few of the locations that I thought were just exceptionally lovely designs for a physical location, which is honestly most of the game. I'm going to take a look at characters first, because while the characters get designs in this game are generally quite nice and pretty good. Um, I mean, I don't think that the specific drawings of them are particularly good, but the designs are mostly quite nice. Um, but two particular favourites of mine are actually Doctor Doom Jazz. I really enjoy the kind of ridiculous surfer frat bro vibe that he brings, despite the fact that he has large pneumatic arms. Um, and it's just a really cool look for, um, you know, Doctor Surfboard MD to have here. In terms of like, like really nice just outfit design. Carmelina's design is really lovely. She's designed, I think I mentioned this in an episode, but she looks very much like she's been influenced, or her design has been influenced by fashion design drawings um, and the, the entire illustrative history, which is actually a really interesting history in its own right. There is this entirely separate branch of illustration that has been uh, part of fashion design for decades and decades. Bonus shout out to Sam Daybreak for uh, maybe and maybe not having tape holding his glasses onto his skeletoni skeletonized head. Uh, in terms of items, I actually have a favourite piece of evidence, and unfortunately it's not in our inventory. So, let's go take a quick look. So, my favourite piece of evidence that I found throughout the entire game is over here, hidden underneath the concrete bridge to the council chambers, because I discovered it organically while behaving as I might do in real life, hopping from rock to rock, looking to see if there's any... I don't know, cool rock pool life going on over here. Oh. Just enjoying the vibes and falling in and drowning 
as, as, as the case may be. But this was the first piece of evidence that made me go, oh, something really big is going on. And I think it may even have been the first inspiration I had that this was a grand conspiracy involving everybody. It was a delightful kind of rug pull moment that kind of really set me up to think that there would be a lot of really interesting pieces of information that would cause me to completely re-evaluate my entire, my entire thought process. Unfortunately, um, the predisposition that set for me was not borne out by the rest of the game, but it was really interesting as an experience. With that out of the way, it's time to take a big old rummage through my laptop for a whole bunch of cool things that I like. So throughout the game, you collect various different uh, bits and bobs. There's a ton of different collectible sodas, whiskies, uh, commemorative uh, god slabs, and um, I think that out of out of all of these, I don't really have a favourite of the little mementos that you find scattered around the island. I think a lot of them aren't super interesting. Uh, they don't shed a huge amount of light on this society, and the ones that do kind of present one of my major problems with the game as a whole of um, simply putting something in into a setting without considering the way that it could have come to exist within that setting, its social, historical, political, structural contexts, the ways that, you know, you can the things you can infer about that society from the existence of a given object. Um, mostly they just feel like they were picked because they seemed like cool things to have rather than because they actually made any sense. Um, or they were less interesting than the designers perhaps thought they were. Although, my favourite random uh, random item is definitely the Wretched CD. A CD containing obnoxiously esoteric music by the embryonic adults, which is completely unlistenable. Not least because there are multiple people of my acquaintance, including my best friend, who would absolutely get a kick out of an album like that. Parasol gets uh, the award for most actually drinkable sounding and most appealing looking soft drinks can out of all of the soft drinks you can collect. I think that if I was presented with the Dead Nebula vending machine in real life, I probably would t would pick Parasol. I like a light floral soda, you know? Something with something a little bit tart, a little bit sweet, but that's not too heavy on the flavor and not too heavy on the sweetness. Sounds good. However, bonus points for Kill the Thirst, which, if I were deciding between novelty sodas at one of those ridiculous import candy shops that have all kinds of weird candy from all over the world, um, I would conceivably pick Kill the Thirst just to see what it was like, because it has such a departure from, uh, like, drinks can design that I would be curious to see what it was like. I would be incredibly disappointed, however, to discover that it is in fact a crisp, light beer, which is the least interesting drink it is possible to drink. Also, bonus shout out to the Tremendous Game Cart, which I for real feel certain must be a reference to a particular actual, actual game, but I forgot to look it up before I started doing this, despite my page of notes. <laughs> I'm not going to pick a favourite whiskey because I think they're all a little bit anodyne in their uh, attempts to be weird, esoteric fiction. Jumping over to music, um, I'm slightly irritated to realise that the careful order I set these into appears to have become completely jumbled, which means I can't pick out the ones I like the most that easily. However, Sunset Song is definitely a major favourite. I'm quite fond, fond of Sunset Song. House of Bliss was a perennial favourite. I definitely had that on a whole bunch while I was doing walking around things that were mostly edited out of the Let's Play. I have a fondness for 8th Street Rose for sounding like a sort of a grand finale song for a uh, romantic anime. And one thing I haven't pointed out tons that I'll talk about a bit more later in this episode, I think, is that like there is just a ton of Japanese influence on this game. But what's really interesting is it's Japanese influence from a Western perspective. Uh, so I say interesting. It's like one of these like curious cultural wibbly squibbly bouncy aroundy chains of influence. It's just it's curious. Anyway, there's a few others that I really like, but honestly, one of my favourite songs isn't here. I don't know if I just missed it. As you can see, there are look, there are, looks like there are 20 slots and I only have 19 of them. I almost 100% of this game, but there were a couple of things I missed. Uh, but uh, one of my absolute top favourites is actually the... Um, I, 
forget the name of it because it's not on this list, but it's it's called something like Arrival or Welcome. Uh, and it's the song that plays on the on the intro screen of the game before you start playing, and that's the only place you can find it. The soundtrack mostly does sparkle. I encourage you to look up the album and uh, just listen to it through, because honestly, I think um, it stands on its own as a, as a kind of a city pop album by itself. It's definitely it's definitely worth listening to. In fact, treating the two things as completely separate abstract works, I think I prefer the album over the game. Finally, I want to take a look at the custom desktop wall uh, backdrops that you can that you can place. I've noticed that there's two broad categories that they that they settle into. There's sort of vapor. Well, there's three broad categories they settle in, settle into. There's Vaporwave through the uh, design lens of this particular game, of which there are quite a few. And then the other two major categories, one is one is cityscapes, which I actually really love. I've always had an intense like aesthetic attraction towards cities. I find them really fascinating and beautiful things to exist. And I don't know if these are stock photos that they've obtained from somewhere, but but <laughs> the stockness of a stock photo doesn't affect its aesthetic qualities. I think that they, they these are genuinely beautiful. And for a large part of the Let's Play, I had I had uh, a variety of these cityscape backdrops, um, of which I think my favourite is probably Escape to the City. I think this is absolutely lovely to look at, and it would be really nice if you could hide this UI and just look at it in the abstract. Um, the third category is <laughs> generic desktop wallpapers circa 2005. The kind of things where if you bought, you know, Windows XP, Windows Vista, uh, these would be the, the desktop wallpapers that you could select between by default. And they're quite nice as well. They do They do have an appeal to them. Then there's a handful of other other scattered aroundy ones, mysterious carp and so on. These ones are these ones are back to the generics. I do I do like the empty beach. And then there's like two or three other ones that I want to shout out, which are like because they're art rather than rather than just photographs. Which is not to say photographs aren't art, but like they are paintings. I quite like this one because it's called. I say it quite like I don't like this one, but it's useful to talk about. Is what I actually mean because this is in no way pop art. I'll leave that there rather than going into a detailed analysis because this isn't really the scope for that and also I would have had to have scripted that ahead of time and I did not. This of course is actually the one I had for most of the rest of the game because I actually just really like it. It's nice to see a different style at play and it's nice to see a fuller picture of Lady Love Dies' outfit. However, Big criticism I have is that Lady Love Dies, as depicted in the standard game art, is chubby, and this anime lady is very much not so. Also, Investigation Freak gets points for being actually a really good painting in its own right. It's one of the only paintings in the game that I think is just genuinely a great painting. Um, unfortunately, we can't see it in its fullness and, and splendour right here. Alright, well, with all of that out of the way, it's time to jump back into the very beginning of the game so that I can wander around and look at stuff in the colour palette which we experienced it for most of the game, rather than this um, cocktail which will get you trashed uh, while also not tasting of alcohol kind of colour palette that we have here at the end of the game, which again, I do find very pleasant if a little overly saccharine. Anyway. So, here we are back at the beginning of the game, before I've done any of the things I did uh, during the extremely long Let's Play I've just completed, which I hope you've watched, because otherwise why are you watching this? Although, if you are going to pick any of my Let's Plays to watch, I would maybe watch Mirror's Edge, or Mist, or Dishonored, or something else. This is a good one, but it's not a brilliant game, unfortunately. So one of the things I really love about this game is the way that it's able to so greatly capture a vibe for an urban space. Which is of course an urban space that I've never been to. 
I I grew up in uh, the <laughs> the inner city in London. I grew up in. Well, you know what? This is a bonus episode. It's fine for me to dispense with my rarely held to bit uh, that I am, in fact, uh, a logistical AI operating a relay hub out in uh, a distant orbit in the solar system. But yeah, so like I grew up in London. This kind of like urban suburban peaceful vibe is something I've never experienced in life, but do you know what I am intimately familiar with it from? That's right, anime. So jumping back to what I was talking about earlier, one of the things that is just kind of interesting about this game is that it was made by two weeaboos. Quite self-admittedly, in interviews they have called themselves weeaboos, who themselves, if I remember correctly, grew up in London, or at least in England. So. Their expectation of this space and what it might be like is also exactly filtered through the same pop cultural media uh, that, that I have familiarity with it from. And you know, watching like anime from the 90s, I always wanted to explore these kinds of spaces. They look so different from what I'm familiar with, and yet so familiar. But regardless, they just in their own right have a, an undeniable beauty which is the beauty shared by various coastal US cities, the kind of like sun-drenched concrete dust and palm trees metropoloi, which are pretty much the other place I've wanted to go to. I told someone once that I'd always wanted to visit LA in the summer, and they told me that I was insane for desiring to put myself through such a horrible um, experience, which may be the case, but you know, we grow up so drenched in, in pop culture now, it's, it's utterly inescapable in a way that was completely alien 200 years ago, even, uh, even 100 years ago. So, given that, to actually be able to step into something that is, is the, almost this kind of like, a symbolic referent which exists only in art to me, to actually go there and step into it would be absolutely fascinating. And so, because of that, it's been absolutely lovely to just walk around this place I think I said in the final episode of the Let's Play, the hour and a half long bumper, bumper spectacular, that um, for all that I trashed this as a game, I'm definitely going to actually miss its presence in my life because it was just nice to come and go for a walk through, through these neighborhoods. So that's why I thought I would um, ramble about this here in the housing districts for that for that fairly obvious reason but there's a couple of other places that I think are worth mentioning which is probably best started with this one I really like this little garden I don't know if it's intentional or not but it feels directly referential to the kind of um, early days of CG art where where people would create renders 2d static renders I talked about this in my um, missed let's play at great length but there was a great deal of art involving smooth planes and edges and sort of large symbolic objects that, um, you know, floating together in the void. And it is out of that, those, of those early days of CG generated, of CG rendered art that, um, that a vaporwave as a genre is constructed. These things are endlessly referential in a kind of like inescapable loop that is delightful to me. And the combinations of marble, fountains, checkerboard patterns, and and greenery in this in this sort of way evoke that really directly to me. But I can't tell if that's intentional, if this is supposed to feel like, you know, an image from an Encarta CD-ROM from 1995, or if it's simply an artifact of the fact that these visuals were created elsewhere in the game to fit the Vaporwave archetype itself. Um, and then putting them together in this way accidentally recreates the original kind of referent to which Vaporwave has been referring. Like, this is why this is why I'm not fun at parties, because I get lost in these endless loops um, while cornering some poor person to listen to me ramble. But, um, yeah. So there's a couple of other locations that I really like, such as... The urban centre here has a real appeal to me, uh, for a couple of different reasons. One is that one of the fascinating things I've always found about cities is 
the way they can be layered over each other. There's not really another another place of, of human existence in the entire world where you can get, you know, a tunnel under a road that leads somehow onto a terrace that passes through these other places. And um, this is always most clear in, like, brutalist architecture. There's certain parts of London, particularly near the Barbican, which have had a large brutalist influence while also being built on hillsides, which results in these fascinating layered cities where roads pass over one another and pedestrian paths coil up and around these spaces. And a single, a single sidewalk might path into a residential building and come out 20 meters higher on the other side than it did on when you first walked onto it while remaining a flat grade. It's, it's, it's strange. And where I live now in Aberdeen, there's actually several parts that are like this as well, because Aberdeen is a very vertical city, but the necessity of building a city requires you to, to inflict flatness on a hillside. So in Aberdeen itself, there are these fascinating coiled tunnels and changes in grade where a five-story building on one side is a one-story building on the same on, on, on the same building on the other side, fronting onto a different road. There are parts of the city where you can get glimpses of all of the strange little industrial curlicues tucked away out of sight in most cities. And those spaces are one of my oldest fascinations, um, artistically speaking. When I when I was at art school, I, I was doing <laughs> projects. Um, on illustrating these kinds of spaces. The kinds of things you only see when you're riding an elevated train and you can see the lost little gaps between buildings where a courtyard has become detached for any of the four buildings creating it. These kinds of strange little abandoned bits, the places where the pipes go, the places where there's chain link fences, these are what really fascinate me. And somehow this game manages to evoke that while also being very, very, very small. There's also, and I mentioned this previously in the Let's Play many, many episodes ago, just a kind of a really delightful intentionality everywhere to this world. One thing that they really pulled off, one thing that they really did very carefully was think about sightlines. The way that you, you move between spaces and that your sightline changes, the way you become lost within a garden in one place and you can see from different places in other places and from any place you can stand that has a view, the things you can see from that view have been thought about and the way that they frame one another. Exploring this game world is just a constant experience of being presented with beautifully composed tableau of a cityscape, which is ridiculous because the difficulty with doing that sort of thing in a game world is that you cannot perfectly account for the player's positioning, which means that you have to construct these places in the same way that real uh, locations are designed to be aesthetically appealing or to produce a particular artistic effect. So I think that's really cool. I think that's really delightful and clever. Everywhere you turn, you get, you get kind of a perfectly framed composition just by looking up or down or to one side. And that shows that a real, real amount of care has been, has been sunk into making this place work as a space. I'd be really fascinated to find out who exactly was responsible for the level design, so to speak, of this game. It's, it's tiny open world, it's structural spaces and how they interfere with one another and how they intersect and integrate. Anyway, that's almost it from me. So, so I wanted to finish up here on the beach because these scattered obelisks really interest me. They're given a structural purpose within the uh, arcane bureaucracy of this world, but what really interests me about them is that they look, for some reason to me, exactly like discarded lipstick containers. I don't know why. They have a much more angular shape, but that's just... that's the the referent evoked in my head by them as, as like, symbolic representations, and I don't know why that's the case. I'm, I imagine that I'm supposed to be thinking of ancient Egyptian obelisks or, or some kind of other sim similar thing, but the scattering of them across this beach as if dropped by some giant forgetful... I was gonna say bimbo, but that's not really that's not really the word I'm looking for here. I need, I need a good snappy word for like a... like a classy little black dress wearer, let's say. Which used to be me, tragically, before I got too sick to dress nice ever. Anyway, um, yeah, so... I think that this actually highlights one of the one of the flaws with the design of this game, which is that its world is too normal. 
We're told every step of the way in words that this game is a strange, esoteric nonsense, um, a weirdness, a cosmic horror. But its world, in terms of its physical aspects, is completely normal. There's, there's nothing that strange about it, except for these rare occasions of things like these, these obelisks scattered across the beach. And I think that they could have gone weirder with it. They could have had more strange stuff dotted around, especially if the strange stuff was naturally incorporated into both the landscape and the infrastructure of this world. Um, if it was normal to these people to have to deal with it every day without realizing that it would be strange to our eyes, um, I think that could be really interesting. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a missed opportunity that um, there's only a handful of places in the game where you get this sort of strange uh, CG surrealist vibe. Um, especially considering we are now at a time when people are starting to make really, really good surreal CG inspired art. Um, are referencing these kind of like multimedia CD-ROMs of the of the early 2000s and these kind of like rendered CG arts from that era and recognizing that they have an aesthetic quality and a stylistic vibe to them that's extremely worthy. Anyway, so this is about as good a time as any for me to realize that I've been rambling for way too long and uh, let you all let you all go. So I hope you enjoyed this little bonus episode of me um, just just wanking off endlessly about about cool big words that I know uh, and not even very many of those and not even particularly rare ones anyway that's going to be it from me for today I hope you join me again for my next let's play now that this one is finally done thanks for watching if you enjoyed this please like subscribe and share I also stream on twitch and I now have a discord server for stream scheduling you can contribute to my existence on Ko-fi or Patreon, and all of those links are in the video description. Thanks so much for watching.